Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you for joining me for another rural crime edition. This is a bonus episode, so I don't put a number on it because it's a bonus episode for now. It's kind of like a trial balloon. It's kind of like I'm giving it a go, doing six episodes per week, and I reserve the right to go, it's too much, and pull back from it. With that said, I don't think I've missed. I think I started doing the rural crime episode in June or July, and we haven't missed a Saturday yet. We've been six episodes a week since then, and so I am very optimistic this is keeping going. But if you want to know why I call it a bonus episode, because I make it sound that way, because I'm very, very strict with myself, which is if I tell you I am going to publish six episodes per week, then I'm going to publish six episodes per week. I am not going to to dog you on that. But if I call it a bonus episode until I'm comfortable that I can do this and I can pull it off, because believe you me, there is some work that goes on behind the scenes to put all these episodes out every week. Until I know I can pull it off, I'm calling it a bonus episode so it sounds like it's a gift. I mean, they're all free, but it sounds like it's a gift. I'm, I'm not making a contract with you, the off-farm income listener, that is guaranteeing you a sixth episode on Saturdays every week, a, a rural crime episode, until I'm confident that I can do this and not shortchange you in the future because I've overwhelmed myself and I've gotten myself too busy. So that's why I call it a bonus episode. That's the same reason I do that on my recap episodes on Thursdays when I get to touch on businesses that I once profiled and I want to profile again for you. So anyway, little explanation there for you on that. Well, hey, something very cool. I, I've i got a couple interviews coming up on our rural crime episode. So I can guarantee, well, I shouldn't guarantee you because sometimes I've got interviews set up and then one reason or another doesn't work out and I don't get the interview. But I have got two interviews scheduled right now specifically around this topic that I am very much enjoying talking about with you of rural crime. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm going to tell you who it is when those interviews come out. But uh, I am I am cautiously optimistic that I will be airing the first of those two interviews a week from today, if you're listening to this on Saturday, the day it comes out, and the second one a week after that, which would be October 3rd, I think, or something like that. I am cautiously optimistic that that is going to be happening. Very excited to have both of these gentlemen on, and I'll explain more as it gets closer. So lots of fun stuff going on. Very much enjoying doing the Rural Crime episode. And uh, at this point, I don't see any reason why it's going to stop. But uh, I am being cautious because I don't want to say I'm going to do something and then not do it. Okay, so let's jump into what we've got this week. So my, uh, my tip of the week, my tip of the week. Now, there is a great book. It is called The Gift of Fear. It's written by Gavin DeBecker. Uh, the company is Gavin DeBecker and Associates. And I am trying to think, man, I hope I haven't talked about this already. If I have, I apologize. I don't think I have. But I talk about this book so frequently, so often, and about this company so frequently and so often that sometimes I go, this sounds familiar, like I've already talked about this. So hopefully I have not. The Gift of Fear, the reason I'm recommending this book, this book is written in the 90s, I think, uh, is because A, it's timeless. B, it says something that needs to be said that very few other people talk about. And C, it is a great book that you get done reading. It's easy to read. You get done reading it. And you've got tools in your tool chest that are important to you. They're going to serve you very, very well. Back when I was a police officer, I recommended that police officers read this book once a year. Every year, once a year. The reason I recommend that is because what this book does is it explains why it's important to trust your intuition and it gives you permission to trust your intuition, even if that means being a jerk to somebody. And I, I'm not going to take this whole episode to explain why being a jerk to somebody is sometimes necessary, but if you read the book, you'll completely understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to link up to this book on my show notes. If you buy it, through my website, well, then I get an affiliate commission, and that is a win-win because you're going to be better off for having this book. Um, But anyway, I'll do that there. But anyway, this book, um, it will give you permission to trust your intuition, trust your gut instincts. 
So why am I bringing this up on as the tip of the week on our rural crime episode? Well, because you drive onto your farm one night. Okay, you come home. You've you've taken you've taken your wife, you've taken your husband, you've taken your partner out to dinner. And you're coming home, it's 9:30, it's dark. And as you're turning into your driveway, you're going to go down the lane to the house. You see something that's out of place. And all it was was a reflection. You saw like a reflection from taillights down by your house. And they don't belong there. And you know because you've turned into your driveway a thousand times, ten thousand times. And your body knows, your mind knows what it should be seeing and what it should not be seeing. So you see taillights. And, you're, and so your senses go up. Why is there a strange car in my driveway? Well, you're at a decision point, right? Do you drive in? Do you back out? Well, at this point, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know what to make of it. It could be somebody, it could be a family emergency and somebody's waiting at the house waiting for you to tell you. It could be a burglar. It could be, I don't know, it could be somebody who used to have family that lived at that place and you've since bought it and they've showed up and they're looking for them. You don't, you just don't know. So you continue up the driveway and as you continue up the driveway, you see somebody standing by the car. Now, this could be any of these scenarios that I just gave to you. It could be somebody there completely innocently. It could be somebody there with very important news for you. It could be a case of mistaken identity. could be a bad guy. It could be a bad guy who's got another bad guy somewhere around the property who is waiting in the shadows because they saw you were coming before you knew they were there. They saw the headlights. So right now is when your intuition, your gut instinct becomes so unbelievably important. Now, you're going to have to read this book because I don't have time to explain it to you in this episode. You're going to have to read this book to truly understand it. But right now, your gut instinct is going to give you a clear what Gavin Becker refers to as a survival signal. And way too many people, when they get that clear survival signal from their gut, ignore it. And they go on to be victimized. Some go on to lose their lives. Some go on to be taken hostage. Some go on to be sexually assaulted. Because you ignored that survival signal from your intuition. And it's at this moment that you're going to get that survival signal. Now, at this moment, your conscious mind, may you may be thinking to yourself, why am I feeling like this is so dangerous? There's just a car parked in my driveway and I see a person standing by it. But your subconscious mind is processing so much more information than your conscious mind can. And it's sending you the danger signal. And you've got to listen to your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind saw the eyes of the person standing by the car dart over to the shed that you're going to park next to to check and see if his buddy was ready. Your conscious mind missed it. Your subconscious mind saw that this person is holding their hand behind their back for some reason. Your conscious mind missed it. Your subconscious mind saw that this person is fidgeting and they can't stand still, but your conscious mind missed it. Whatever the different signals and signs are, your subconscious mind is picking it up and sending signals to you to get away. It is dangerous before your conscious mind can process all of that and you have to trust it you have to trust it and that's why this book is so important because it gives you permission to do that and it shows you how it shows you examples of people who turned that off who ignored it so they wouldn't be rude to someone so they wouldn't be a jerk to someone so so, so they wouldn't embarrass themselves uh, by mistakenly leaving a situation and then later having to explain i didn't know what was going on and then they became a victim because of it so picture, picture a deer that walks into a meadow. A deer is all instinct, almost no rational thought. It's all instinct, certainly no care or concern for your feelings. And you're a hunter. You're a hunter and you're standing in the tree line and you're waiting to harvest this deer. And this deer walks out there and it's, it's walking out there with an abundance of caution because it is prey and you are a predator. And it senses something. It sees Something in the tree line that's just out of place that's not normally there. Maybe it smells something in the air that's just not normally there. And it runs. 
and it jumps the fence, and it's back into the trees before you can even get your rifle up. That tree, if it sat there and it worried and it went, why do I feel weird about this right now? It would be gone. You would harvest it. If that deer had the ability for rational thought and sat there and went, this seems dangerous. I don't like the way I feel. But if I run off, I'm really going to hurt that guy's feeling. That guy over there standing there with the uh, with the rifle and the orange vest. I'm He's going to be really upset and feel bad if I take off. You're going to harvest that deer and that deer is going to cease to exist. That's why you have to read The Gift of Fear. Or anybody who can hear my voice right now, you have got an ancestor that's back 10,000 years, 100,000 years, however you believe. You've got an ancestor going all the way back, all the way back. And that line of your family found a way to survive through all those years of, what do you want to call What do you want me to call it? Human evolution, development, the development of the human species, the years in which survival was an everyday thought. It's not an everyday thought for us now, but you've got an ancestor. You've got genetics that goes all the way back into that. And those genetics and that instinct, that adaptation, that survival of the fittest that is built into you through all of your previous ancestors, it's in you as well. But today, because we live in such a safe society, we will ignore those signals when they show up, but they show up for a reason. And I will tell you what, I read this book for the first time after becoming a police officer and realized it is so true because one of the biggest things that gets police officers hurt or killed or ambushed is complacency and complacency comes from ignoring these danger cues and you should be that deer in the meadow as a police officer and too many police officers shut it off they don't want to they don't want to live their working life at that height of awareness and you really should but we all should so my tip of the week the Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. It is a great and timeless, timeless book. I have been to one of their advanced threat assessment classes. I've gotten to know people in the organization. I taught a domestic violence class at Boise State University, and I got them to donate this book and actually sell it at a discount. Then I got another uh, nonprofit to, to buy it, and I gave this book to every single one of my students, period. I give this book away more than any book any other book i give this book away more it's very important i've got a friend whose daughter went off to college this fall and i made her promise me and forced her as much as i could to read this book before she left her home and went off to college it's a very very important book the gift of fear by gavin de becker okay well man that was a long tip of the week everybody let's jump into what i've got for you rural crime wise now, what did I do? I thought I had two stories up here, but I only see one. So I screwed up. Sorry about that. I've only got one rural crime story for you from the U.S., but I've got a couple chalk one up for the good guy. So I will make up for it. I promise. We're long anyway. We're long anyway because I am. Uh, I did a long tip of the week. Okay, so here we go. We're going to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This is uh, Lebanon County, I think. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Lebanon County. Now, I have been through this area. So a couple years ago, I did this big East Coast trip. Started out, I met with the folks at the National Farm Bureau in Washington, D.C. And I drove north up to Cumberland Valley High School in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. That was a beautiful drive. Went through northern Virginia, uh, eastern West Virginia, then all the way up through... Pennsylvania. That was gorgeous and spoke with an FFA chapter and then worked my way up to Hartford, Connecticut to cover farm aid, which was really cool. So I've been in this area, interesting area. Here's the title. This comes from abc27.com news. A Lebanon County man arrested for vandalism in overnight crime spree. Now, you read that you read that uh, heading and this is not telling half of the story. I don't know how many of you have heard of this story already, but in an election year, this is a pretty phenomenal story. And you look at the booking photo of this young man who was arrested, and I've looked at a lot of booking photos in my time, and this young man, he doesn't have 
red eyes, like he's not under the influence of drugs or drunk, like being arrested for DUI. He hasn't been beat up. He just looks like a, a young man. So, it, it, you know, with me, with my time in law enforcement, I look at this and I go, well, what is the story here? Why does he look so non-drunk driver or non-drugged out or non-beat up? Well, let me read you the story. It says here, a Lebanon County man has been arrested and charged for an overnight crime spree of vandalism and theft on Monday night, the Lebanon County District Attorney's Office said. 24-year-old John Shanfelder of Richland is accused in stealing Donald Trump and we support our police yard signs in addition to spray painting racist and, okay, racist in quote, so he spray painted the word racist. It's not a description of what he spray painted. He spray painted the word racist and then ACAB, A-C-A-B, which you, if you haven't heard from all of the different riots going on around the country, that stands for all cops are bad. So he spray painted the word racist and ACAB, the acronym ACAB, on private property and he vandalized vehicles and farm equipment. Several police departments received 13 reports of vandalism Monday night. The district attorney's office says police are still receiving additional calls for vandalism. Shanfelder has been charged with felony criminal mischief, 10 counts of theft, criminal trespass, three counts of loitering, and prowling at nighttime. So, something fired up this young man. I don't know if it was a Donald Trump rally. I don't know if it was a protest over police brutality. But uh, there's been more and more talk about this, which is interesting. There's been more and more talk that you've heard coming out of the radical sex of the rioters, uh, whether it be Antifa, uh, Black Lives Matter. And I'm talking about the radical sex. Not, not everybody that's involved with Black Lives Matter is radical. But on the, the radical components, there's been more and more talk of get out of our neighborhoods and into the suburbs. Well, now this, this young man took it to a whole new level. He headed out to the farms. He's going to he's gonna make his statement out of the farms. Now, from a purely logistical standpoint, this is really, really poor planning just because efficiency-wise, going out into a rural area, there's so much space and land between houses that one night's work is going to have a lot less impact. So from an efficiency standpoint, I'm going to give him a D-. minus. But man, from a courage standpoint and from an innovativeness standpoint, this kid gets an A. I mean, to go out onto farms and start spray painting stuff and calling people racist and stealing their Donald Trump yard signs. And not just the Donald Trump yard signs, but the we support our police yard signs. Uh, an A for courage and an A for being innovative as a radical protester. Uh, so hats off to you, John Shan Shanfelder, for courage and innovativeness. But oh my goodness, come on. Stealing we support our police signs off of farms. Spray painting racist and ACAB on private property. Vandalizing farm equipment. What are you so mad at farmers for? That takes a lot of anger to get you to this point, doesn't it? And I guess my whole theory about the Second Amendment and the uh, belief that you can be shot for trespassing did not apply to Mr. Shanfelder. He did not care. He went out there. He prowled around. And man, and and I'm not even going political, but if you are a if you're a Trump hater or a Biden hater, either one, imagine the embarrassment of getting arrested for stealing their signs. For stealing them, because he's got he's charged with felony criminal mischief and ten counts of theft, which I think are the Trump signs. I guess in the we support the police signs. But man, you tell everybody you hate you hate Trump, you hate Biden, whoever. You don't want to get caught stealing their signs. It makes it look like you love them doesn't it? If you're stealing their stuff? I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. All right. That was one that uh, I had to bring to you guys. Okay. Quick word from our sponsors, Lacrosse Footwear. You can find them over at lacrossefootwear.com. Done right since 1897, Lacrosse Footwear has been making quality boots for hunting, working, and tending the land for over a century. And of course, I say it all, you know, I say it all the time, and I'm doing a survey right now. I hope you guys will fill it out about 
me running these ads on this show. So I say it every day that I wear the Alpha Ranch boots from lacrosse every day of the year on my farm. I really do. That's why I say it every day. I irrigate in the summer. I need rubber boots. I feed in the winter. And where we live, we never stay frozen. We never stay thawed. So we're constantly just in this crusty mud in the winter. So I need good boots. And I wear them every single day. We want you to do the very same thing. Put on a pair of Alpha Range boots. You will not be sorry. They're going to last you forever because I'm still on my very first pair that I bought way before lacrosse was ever a sponsor. You can find them over at lacrossefootwear.com. And then, of course, Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. I love my Powder River, my squeeze chute, my livestock panels. They're not just cattle handling equipment. They are problem solvers. I will admit to you, I cheaped out and I bought lightweight panels when we first started on our farm. Now, I knew about Powder River and I wanted Powder River, but I didn't want to pay the extra money because you're right. You're going to pay more. You're going to pay a premium for Powder River. But now that I finally went out and bought Powder River, and by the way, again, before they were a sponsor, I realized the error in my ways and the poor judgment because I wouldn't have had to buy two sets of panels if I would have just have started out with Powder River. We want you to do the same. Check out everything they've got to offer you over at powderriver.com and let your local farm and ranch retailer know. You want to see that Powder River green out in their sales yard so you can also purchase the finest in livestock handling equipment. Okay, so our next segment, where the Second Amendment does not exist. Now, I will tell you what. I may have to change the title of this segment coming up. This has something to do with one of our coming up interviews. And I've already got a few hints that maybe I'm wrong about this, but we will see. I've got an interview coming up where we can touch on this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into this article here about rural crime in the United Kingdom. And I want to hone in on a part about animal rights activists, which I found very, very interesting. So this comes from a publication called The Argus, coming out of the United Kingdom, and it says, Sussex rural crime members fear animal rights protests. The Countryside Alliance asked its Sussex members about their concerns in an annual survey. It found that more than 40% of members had been the victim of a crime in the past year and a majority believed rural crime in the county has gone up. Now remember, we've talked about this a few times, but going out and polling people to see if they've been a victim of crime is always a better way to find out truly how much crime is going on in a given area than relying on police reports because so many people don't report crimes to the police. Okay. It says here one in five did not oh here we go. One in five did not report their concerns to the police, saying they saw no point in doing so or believe there was nothing the police could do. You know, I hear that. The police are never going to catch these people. They stole tools. There's no serial numbers on the tools. And they stole them out of the back of my truck. There's no physical evidence. I hear that. But you just, the problem is you never know. You never know how a piece of information is going to help. I encourage you all to report these things. It says here, fly tipping, thefts from outbuildings, and dog attacks on livestock were also big concerns. We've been covering that. And then it says here, among the 228 responses, 37% said they feared animal rights activists. In January, the Argus reported on how more than 100 protesters from animal rights group Direct Action Everywhere, DXE, had gone to Hode's Farm in Broad Oak near Hastings under the cover of darkness. The group wanted to, quote, hold the free-range industry accountable, end quote, and live-streamed footage inside the farm. The activists also chained themselves together on the farm's driveway. Okay, so I wanted to touch on that. Now, this is not unique to the United Kingdom. Animal rights activists doing this stuff. In my little home county of Stanislaus County, California, just about two years ago, on, is it, Oh, is it Dale Road? No, it's not Dale Road. Lad? It's not Lad either. 
Sorry, I'm remember I'm not remembering the name of the road, and I really should. It makes me sad when I forget stuff about where I grew up. Anyway, out there in the country, about two miles to the north of Valley Home, uh, right over the San Joaquin County line inside Stanislaus County, there is a dairy. And like so many dairies, they have calf boxes, and they pull their calves off of their milk string and start bottle feeding their calves and raising them up. Well, a bunch of animal rights activists showed up at this dairy, blocked the road, went on to the dairy and quote unquote started rescuing calves, grabbing calves, pulling them off, taking them. And this was not an isolated one day event. This happened multiple times to the point where the Stanislaus County Sheriff's Office, of whom I used to work for, were able to organize themselves and to get out there and to be able to stop these protests and stop these protesters from going on to private property. They still were able to protest, but they had to stay out on the road. This was, I don't know, two years ago. This is not an isolated event. This happens. And imagine this. Imagine you get up, you're just trying to do your job. You're trying to feed people and survive as a farmer. And there's a bunch of these animal rights protesters chained across your driveway. I, you know, I don't know. Do you put the disc on the tractor? I, I don't know. I don't know. No, you don't. We resolve these things non-violently. Yes, we call the local authorities. Anyway, I wanted to touch on that because uh, that does not just happen in places like the United Kingdom. That certainly happens right here in the U.S. of A. And, uh, man, I, like I've told you, we've got a dairy. Um, I'm not going to tell you where. Not because I don't trust all of you, but anybody who happens to jump in and listen to my show with, you know, militia, uh, militia, uh, malicious intentions, I don't want them to hear. But there is a dairy in my area where I live now, and they've put up a wall that borders the road. You cannot see into that dairy, and good for them. Extra expense, but you know what? Good for them uh, because it's going to be very difficult for these groups to come and and do that type of stuff on their dairy. And I applaud them for taking those proactive steps. And, you know, you can say what you want about different laws and, and different ways of doing things. But one thing we do know about the animal rights groups, and go over to the Animal Agricultural Alliance and read up on their website, and they'll tell you all about this. But one thing we do know they will do is they will go onto properties and multiple properties, and they don't, they're don't they not fair and balanced. And I'm not, I don't even have cable. I don't watch Fox News, but... That term is a good term. They are not fair and balanced, meaning they put undercover people on farms and dairies and feedlots and things like that working there to, to gather undercover, undercover footage. And then they cherry pick the worst of the worst. They show it to you and they try and paint the entire animal agriculture industry with that brush. But they got no credibility because they don't show you all the film and footage they've got of people not abusing animals and people taking care of livestock. And therefore they lose all credibility. So you got to be wary of this stuff, and it's not just the United Kingdom. All right, one more from the United Kingdom. Now, this one's interesting. It's a little, It's a, you're going to have to bear with me on this one. It's a little bit outside the box. This comes from a, this comes from a, I think a blog called Food Safety News, Breaking News for Everyone's Consumption. Nice play on words. All right, three sentenced after discovery of illegal sleep sleep sheep slaughtering say that three times fast and tell me that you don't say sleep shoddering at least once sheep slaughtering sheep slaughtering sheep slaughtering and that wasn't fast i know okay all right three men have received a suspended prison had received suspended prison sentences for offenses relating to the illegal slaughter of sheep at a farm. Now, it does not say that they were illegally on the farm. It could have been these guys' farms. I don't know. Sean Burns, John Clayton, and Kenneth Darren Evans were found by officers of Pembrokeshire County Council in Wales preparing sheep carcasses, which had been slaughtered into Smokies. Now, I love reading this stuff out of the United Kingdom because I learn something every week. So I looked this up. What in the world is a smoky? I know what a little smoky is. Like Super Bowl Sunday, someone's got a crock pot, they've got barbecue sauce, and they got these tiny little hot dogs in there. Little smokies. Delicious. But in the United Kingdom, a smoky is this. 
Smokies are an illegal product created by singeing the fleece off of the carcass of a sheep to leave the surface of the meat with a smoky color and leaving the carcass with a strong smoky smell due to the burning process. They are mostly sold in ethnic communities which view them as a delicacy. Smokies cannot be produced legally because the skin is left on the carcass of the animal. This is not allowed for sheep meat in Europe. Okay, in Europe. Sorry, I had a typo there. So this is illegal in Europe. So it's interesting. People want... Well, let me continue with the article, and then we'll uh, we'll do that. It says here, the men were sentenced at Swansea Crown Court early earlier this week for offenses at Bramble Hall Fair... Bramble Hall Farm, Ferry Lane, and Pembroke Dock on January 21st, 2019. Oh, man, over a year ago. Burns and Clayton were found guilty following a week-long trial in February of this year. It says here, Burns pleaded not guilty to operating a food establishment without the required approval, running a slaughterhouse that failed to meet legal requirements relating to hygiene, failing to ensure food premises were clean and maintained in good repair, possessing unsafe food for the purpose of sale, and failing to collect animal byproducts in line with legal requirements. He was found guilty on all five counts. Clayton pleaded guilty to two charges of possessing unsafe food for the purpose of sale and failing to collect animal byproducts in accordance with legal requirements. He denied three charges of operating a food site without the required approval operating a slaughterhouse that failed to meet specific legal requirements relating to hygiene and failing to ensure food premises were clean and maintained in good repair, but he was found guilty on all parts. So, on all counts. So, this is similar to what we see in the U.S. So, for example, um, the battles that all of you who are raising pastured poultry on your own farm and you're doing the slaughter and the cleaning and selling direct to consumers, the battle that you're always potentially faced with over government regulation coming in and saying you can no longer do that. Now, we already cannot do that with any other livestock. It's just poultry. So with cattle, with pork, with sheep, with with uh, goats, uh, we can't do that. Uh, it's got to it's gotta go to a USDA-inspected uh, butchering facility. And if you want to sell individual cuts of meat, that facility where it's getting slaughtered and butchered at has to have an inspector on the floor, to my understanding, 100% of the time. So it's even harder for us to find a facility where we can legally have an animal butchered and then sell like individual steaks, individual packs of ground beef or lamb or goat or pork or whatever that may be. So that, that we already faced that challenge in the U.S. So this is an interesting one because obviously in the United Kingdom, people want these Smokies. There's a demand for them, and therefore there is a black market for these Smokies. So that's that's interesting to me. Um, sorry, my dog is creating a ruckus here in the studio. So that's interesting to me because it's it's no different here in the United States. Now, I've read enough books about pastured poultry and the fights that people have to have to make sure that they can continue to sell direct after slaughter and cleaning. But we cannot do that with other livestock and we can't even just do that with other livestock at at any USDA inspected butcher facility. It's got to be a specially inspected butcher facility. So that creates a big challenge for us, right? We want to direct market and sell individual cuts of beef. Well, there's other there's other black markets here in the United States. Um, ethnic markets here in the United States. Now, I sell goats, and I used to sell them direct off the farm. As a matter of fact, I used to allow individual people to do their slaughtering and their butchering here on the farm. And I'll tell you why I did. And I still would today. By the way, I still would today um, because these poor folks are between a rock and a hard place from what I understand. Now, I have been taught this uh, by a gentleman who lives in Cuna where I live. He is from, I forget what country in Africa, um, but he's from a country in Africa and he's Muslim. And he taught me how um, 
how a Muslim is required to slaughter and butcher the animals they're going to consume and how this has to be a sacrifice. Uh, and I'm sorry if I, I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm trying to regurgitate what he taught me. Uh, it's supposed to be a sacrifice to Allah. Uh, when they slaughter, the animal is to be faced to the east towards Mecca. Uh, they must calm the animal. Um, they must say Allah Akbar multiple times. I mean, I've watched I watched them do this. And then, then it is, and please forgive me if I'm wrong about this. I believe that once they do it and they do it that way, that it is halal. But I don't know if I'm right about the terminology. Now, what he told me, was that all Muslims are required to make a sacrifice every so often. Well, we've got, where I live, we have a ton of people who are Muslim who have come here as refugees. And so they find themselves living in Idaho as a refugee. But of course, their faith comes ahead of everything else, as does mine. And so they find themselves living here, and there is nowhere for them to go where they can purchase meat that has been sacrificed appropriately so they can do what it is required of them through their faith. This is what I understand from this gentleman who I've sold goats to. And so what has developed here is a black market for this meat. And the reason it's a black market is because there's nowhere for them to get this done legally where the USDA will say, Okay, you're legal to sell individual cuts of meat. So, at our livestock auction uh, here locally, when they're selling goats, you've got a lot of people from countries like Africa and Iraq and Afghanistan who are in there. They're bidding on they're bidding on the goats, and then they're going to take them somewhere and they're going to butcher them and they're going to sell these cuts of meats that have been butchered appropriately so people can fulfill their religious obligations. So they're between a rock. In a hard place. Now, I don't, I don't uh, get involved in the black market at all. Uh, when people want to butcher here on my farm, they all tell me it's for their own consumption, whatever it may be, and and I let them do that. But I've stopped doing that. I've started selling all my goats at the auction because there's a number of reasons for doing that. The market is better. I don't have to haggle, um, and it, it is the most free market we have uh, versus the the one on one. So that's why I do it. Um, but that is going on. It, and it's because there's a demand for this. Um, so it's interesting. There are a lot of arguments against the regulation of the USDA on stuff like this. And there's a lot of arguments for the regulation for food safety. And I don't know enough to make a strong argument one way or another. But I do feel for the folks who, in adhering to their faith, they find themselves between a rock and a hard place. And that is enough of a motivator to create a strong enough demand to create a black market. And I know we've got one right here. And I'm sure that if you if you have the same population dynamics wherever you live, I'm sure you've got the same type of black market going on where you're at as well. Or maybe, maybe you live in a place where, um, you know, the population of refugees coming in and, and folks who find themselves in this situation has grown large enough that a business has arisen that can handle this legally. But where I'm at, I don't believe we have one. And therefore, we've got... Uh, We've got this black market. So very interesting. People want stuff. Uh, people move to a different country uh, because they're a refugee for one reason or another, but they miss the the type of food that they used to consume, and they want that They want that again, and here we have Smokies. We all learned something new. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump over to our final segment, Chalk One Up for the good guys, you know, these are articles of where uh, somebody who's doing something bad in our rural communities, they get held accountable. Now, I was telling you earlier about the young man in Pennsylvania who was stealing the support the police signs, the Donald Trump signs, and how his booking photo just did not look like the thousands of booking photos that I had seen throughout my career as a police officer and detective. Well, I'll tell you what, we're back, everybody. In this first article, we have got a booking photo that uh, reminds me of the good old days. So this, this, uh, and I'll link up to this if you want to check it out. This periodical, this newspaper, I guess, is simply titled The News, Empower Yourself. And it says it's uh, published in Port Arthur, Netherlands, 
Port Niches and Groves, Texas. I have been to Port Arthur and then went on down south to Port Aransas. I really like the Gulf Coast. I just love Texas in general, but I really, really enjoyed the Gulf Coast. Okay, so title of this article JCSO, I'm assuming that is the county sheriff's office. Yep, Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Carjacking, stolen tractor, and stolen guns lead to wild scene and an arrest. And I will tell you what, this booking photo is just what you would expect. It says here, a local man is accused of stealing a tractor, stalling out on Hildebrandt Bridge, and carjacking an elderly man during an early morning crime spree authorities said. Jefferson County Sheriff's Office deputies responded to Farm to Market Road 365 at the Hildebrandt Bridge in reference to an aggravated robbery just after 7 a.m. on Monday. Investigation revealed a man had stolen a John Deere tractor just minutes earlier from a nearby ranch. Always a good idea. Also taken in the theft were two handguns, the Sheriff's Office said. According to witnesses, the thief was unable to drive the tractor up the bridge, causing the vehicles to come to a stop and begin backing up. The armed man got off of the stalled tractor, police said, and ran up to an elderly male motorist and stole his truck at gunpoint. The assailant, assailant, well, I'm close. The assailant was last seen Monday morning heading towards Port Arthur in the stolen truck. The victim was not injured. So that's good. Good for that guy that did the carjacking, that he didn't go all the way with it. The stolen vehicle was later recovered in Port Arthur. During the investigation, Jefferson County Sheriff's detectives developed a lead on the suspect. And Monday afternoon, an arrest warrant was issued for 33-year-old Garrett Piazza. Is he related to Mike Piazza? The great catcher for the Mets and Dodgers? Who knows? 33-year-old Garrett Piazza of rural Jefferson County for aggravated robbery aggravated robbery is interesting we didn't have that in any of the states i worked we just had robbery but we had strong arm robbery we had armed robbery so maybe that's the difference he had the gun anyway garrett was arrested at approximately 6 30 p.m monday in beaumont bond for the aggravated robbery is set at five hundred thousand dollars and the bond for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle is set at $250,000, according to information from the Jefferson County Correctional Facility. So good for the good guys that they caught this guy. And you know what? In all seriousness, for Mr. Piazza, I don't know what you're going through. I would guess it has to do with drugs. And you did not shoot that man when you stole his truck. Your life's not over. You can turn it around. And that I do truly mean with all sincerity. You truly can. Uh, So hopefully you do. Hopefully you do. But uh, anyway, I've got a story very similar to this. It spanned from my the town I graduated high school in, Modesto, California. It spanned all the way from there all the way to Boise, Idaho. It's one of my most phenomenal stories uh, that I got out of my law enforcement career. And I intend to tell it to you all someday. It takes me a while to get through it. And so, as always, I'm running behind on time here. So I'm not going to be able to do it today but one of these days i'm going to tell you this story because it is unbelievable i'm not saying that mr piazza was on meth but i can tell you with no question the guy in my story was and the things that people on meth can survive amaze me amaze me and this story illustrates that and then the the just path of destruction and crime and just chaos that can follow somebody on a meth binge uh, are amazing to me. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So one of these days I will get to that story. This is, I vow. This is, I vow. Okay. Our last story, another one, chalk one up for the good guys. This comes from theguardonline.com, the Batesville Daily Guard. It says here, two in custody after theft and vandalism. Two suspects are in the Independence County Jail awaiting formal charges after an incident on a farm in Independence County belonging to Justice of the Peace Keith Harmon. So if I'm reading this paragraph correct, these two went and did their criminal activities on a farm that belongs to the county's Justice of the Peace. I mean, that would be like 
spray painting a cab on Andy Griffith's front door in Mayberry. Who would do that? Where's that guy from Pennsylvania? Okay. Continue. I don't know why I'm trying so hard to be funny today. Continuing on with this story. Eric Waterman, age 21, and William Todd Burtfield, age 21, are in custody as of Tuesday morning. Sheriff Don Stevens, excuse me, Sheriff Sean Stevens, responded to Harmon's farm on Monday about, quote, some of his farm equipment being damaged and some stolen. Harmon reported a service truck being stolen as well as a pair of tractor-trailer trucks were attempted to be moved, according to Stevens' report. Harmon also told Stevens that his 8310 John Deere tractor had been broken into and damaged. Stevens said that he found the tractor had windows broken out and, quote, noticed the toolbox was open and a pull pin that had been in the toolbox was laying in the floorboard of the tractor, end quote. Harmon reported that the tools that had been in the toolbox were missing. Stevens said he inspected a white 1997 International and noticed the battery box had been taken apart. The drive shaft had been twisted in two. The windows busted out of both doors, and the windshield was busted. Stevens said he contacted Chief Deputy Aaron Moody at that point to bring some more equipment to help process the scene. Chief Deputy Moody and Investigator Michael Moody, who knows if they're related, arrived to assist in the investigation. One of Harmon's employees reported to Stevens that the service truck that Harmon had reported stolen was located in a low spot stuck in the mud. Stevens stated in his report that he went to the field where the service truck was reportedly located and noticed that the 2001 Dodge 3500 flatbed had been completely burned up, according to Stevens' report. A GMC flatbed was also vandalized, according to Stevens. Stevens said he also found a 1989 international tractor trailer that was attempted to be moved and the power divider had been torn out of the truck, thus causing the rear end to be torn up and unable to operate. Chief Deputy Moody notified Stevens that he had made contact with Waterman at a trailer park at 200 Double Road. Now, I have reread this a few times, and there is something missing from either if this is the police report or the article written by the author of this article. I can't find anywhere in here where it indicates how Chief Deputy Moody figured out that Waterman was a suspect. All it says is Chief Deputy Moody notified Stevens that he had made contact with Waterman at a trailer park. So that's all well and good, but how did they figure out that they needed to make contact with Waterman? That's a missing piece here. So if you're wondering, I am also wondering. Uh, Moving on. After getting a detailed description of the missing tools from Harmon, Stevens and Moody arrived at the location and noticed some of the described tools in the back of the truck were at the Double Road location, 200 Double Road location. Waterman then agreed to go with Stevens and Chief Moody to the sheriff's office, so he went with consent, which is different than being placed under arrest. Stevens also ordered the truck located at the trailer park and pounded for evidence processing. While waiting for the tow truck, an employee of the trailer park informed Stevens that Waterman had shown up late for work today and had been trying to give away some tools. Why would you steal them if you're just going to give them away? According to Stevens' report. Now, this is interesting. This is just a little a little nuance of law enforcement work that uh, you may have glossed over hearing this. It says here, Stevens also ordered the truck located at the trailer park and pounded for evidence processing. Now, the tools were found in the back of this truck, but we don't know that this truck was used in the commencement of the crime. It's not one of the trucks that was stolen, but he impounded it for evidentiary purposes, which is well within his authority. But I will tell you from years of experience, that's not something we would normally do in a case like this. But now this guy's truck has been impounded. So while the police are not supposed to hand out punishment, every now and then within the realms of police discretion, we can make life harder on bad guys. And that's what that sounds like to me. Right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what that sounds like to me. 
Stevens said the employee stated the tools were on a table in the front yard of Waterman's residence. Okay. Stevens went to the yard at lot 42 of the trailer park and observed two plastic containers laying on a table in the front yard. Stevens said he was able to see that the boxes contained John Deere parts and there was more items that had been described as taken. Chief Deputy Moody informed Stevens that he had the location of the other spe- other suspects, so he must have got that from this guy that they've taken to the station. And then contact was then made with Burt Field, with both men agreeing to speak at the sheriff's office. Stevens and Waterman stated that he and Burt Field went riding around and was drinking alcohol, traveling to Hutchinson Mountain and then to Desha. Waterman added in his statement that the two went into the bottoms and found the equipment sitting there. And Waterman told authorities that Burtfield wanted to drive the tractor trailer truck, adding that Burtfield tried to move the truck and it tore up because Burtfield did not release the brakes. Waterman also told county authorities they found the Dodge 3500 and started driving it around the field. When the truck got stuck in the field, Waterman said there were two uh, excuse me, said the two were afraid their fingerprints would be found, so the truck was soaked in diesel and set on fire. Well, that is just great. Adding that they got some tools from the equipment and took them and found the other tractor trailer truck and tried to move it. In Burt Field's interview, Stevens' report said when the two suspects arrived in the bottoms, they found the equipment and Waterman wanted to try and drive the tractor trailer truck. Burt Field stated the truck tore up would not go, so he gave a consistent statement. Stevens' report also said that Burt Field told authorities they found the Dodge 3500 and Waterman got in the truck, started doing donuts in the field and got stuck. So they're telling the same story. So good for these guys. It sounds like they're being honest at least. And Stevens report, Burt Field said Waterman got scared about prints on the truck, put diesel and set on fire, consistent. Burt Field added in the interview that they found the other tractor trailer truck and Waterman tried to drive it but could not get it to move. Burtman's, uh, Burt Field told Stevens, when the fire got big from the Dodge 3500, they left the bottom. So pretty much this reporter is just pulling a lot out of the police report and putting it in here. That's why it's so long. Okay, so this was all done under the influence of alcohol. I think we talked about this last week, right? Alcohol does not improve the decision-making process. Now, I don't know where you all stand when it comes to the legalization of marijuana. I will tell you, I have never ingested marijuana in any form in my entire life, and this is not a Bill Clinton moment. I never in my entire life had. But I can tell you, after 15 years in law enforcement, I have seen people on legal alcohol make horrible decisions and do stuff like this over and over and over again. And I am yet to experience a situation where somebody just loses their mind and makes a bunch of horrible decisions like this when they are using marijuana, exclusively marijuana. Marijuana with other stuff involved, yes. But just marijuana, no. Just food for thought. I'm not trying to tell you what to do or that we should legalize or not legalize marijuana. But... uh, When I hear about these guys drinking and doing this crazy stuff, it always makes me think of that. So there you are. Poor decision making under the influence of alcohol. Well, that is all I've got for you this week on our Rural Crime bonus episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you continue to enjoy them. We've got some great interviews coming up for you. I am very cautiously optimistic over the next couple weeks. And until then, and as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.